Please be seated. Last week at the House of Bishops annual meeting, the bishops of the church did something that they don't do that often. That is to say, they, they issued a letter to the whole church. It's even rarer that they do something like that on a political theme. And yet, they issued it, and I will read it to you now. On Good Friday, the following political forces of the day the ruling political forces of the day, tortured and executed an innocent man. They sacrificed the weak and the blameless to protect their own status and power. On the third day, Jesus was raised from the dead, revealing not only their injustice, but also unmasking the lie that might makes right. In a country still living under the shadow of the lynching tree, we are troubled by the violent forces being released by this nation's political rhetoric. Americans are turning against their neighbors, particularly those on the, merge, on the margins of society. They seek to secure their own safety and security at the expense of others. There is legitimate reason to fear where this rhetoric and the actions arising from it might take us. In this moment, we resemble God's children wandering in the wilderness. We, like they, are struggling to find our way. They turned from following God and worshipped a golden calf constructed from their own wealth. The current rhetoric is leading us to construct a modern false idol out of power and privilege. We reject the idolatrous notion that we can ensure the safety of some by sacrificing the hopes of others. No matter where we fall on the political spectrum, we must respect the dignity of every human being, and we must seek the common good above all else. We call for prayer for our country, that a spirit of reconciliation will prevail, and we will not betray our, our true selves. Now, the letter has already received some criticism for being political, but it does speak to a legitimate fear, fear that I have heard voiced on all ends of the political spectrum that something different and frightening is happening. Republican, Democrat, and independent friends have all voiced the concern that there is some breakdown in social order. And so in a way, I kind of think the bishops missed a comparison that we might want to think about. They compared this to the time in the wilderness. I think we can compare it to what happened in today's gospel. This letter has a place in today's sermon because it gives us a good sense of what the atmosphere was like during that first Holy Week. Think of the atmosphere. The tension was palpable. It was ready to explode. It was like dry leaves surrounded by matches. And it was confusing. People were excited for, one, for something one minute and then hated it the second. They, loved, they were loving one moment and raging the next. They greeted Jesus as a savior and then just days later shouted for his death on the cross. When I was 18 and I was an exchange student in Berlin, we had a science teacher. And one day something struck her and she decided that she wanted to share a story about when she was a teenager. It was during the closing days of World War II. And she was in the, the, the Olympic Stadium, and you know, there's, there's Goebbels was there, and he was doing this infamous speech called the Total War speech, where he says, do you want the total war? And everybody shouts hysterically, yes, 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 even though the place is already crumbling around them. And she said, you know, it was so exciting and so terrifying at the same time, and we were all shouting there, and I was right there shouting, yes, 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 until I left the stadium and started walking home. 
and burst into tears, realizing what we had said. Many knew what they were doing, but many didn't. Not really. In a way, we ought to be able to relate both to those back then and to this science teacher of mine, because nobody knew what they were doing back then. Many, certainly in Jesus' day, were lashing out violently when it might not have been their nature typically, or at least they didn't know it was in their nature. They, like us, did not know what they did. This is frightening. Groups blame each other for the increasingly escalating acts of violence. And there have been promises of riots. It was no less frightening back in Jesus' day when Jesus was walking the earth and he entered into Jerusalem. The Romans were there and they had control. And they didn't like when people got upset. They liked it calm. And it was anything but. The only problem here is the one who was causing all this stir was Jesus. And he was causing it with his message of forgiveness and love and care for the poor and care for the stranger and his critique on the rich and the powerful. His entry into Jerusalem, as as innocuous as it seems, set every leader on edge because they feared he would cause a revolution and destroy their way of life. People really didn't know what to do. And it wasn't difficult to turn them from adulation to murder. So is it any wonder then that Jesus, as he hung on the cross, cried out to God, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they're doing. This is a good day to ask ourselves if we know what we're doing in this strange world that we're encountering. We do well to ask ourselves if we are also caught up in the fray if we're also those who are shouting for blood. This day is the day of all days when we acknowledge that we are so easily turned from God's ways in the face of human temptations, whether they be fear, jealousy, or rage. Sometimes, if you watch the news, you might feel hopeless. They felt hopeless then too. But we, we have an advantage. Unlike them, we know in whom we can hope. We don't know what this tense time will bring for our nation or for the world, but we can trust that the one whom all had supposed had been destroyed did in fact rise from the dead. And so we trust we will not be destroyed forever either. We believe that in following his path of reconciliation and of caring for and respecting the dignity of every human being, we will bring life where it seems desolate. We can trust that the one we follow will, in the end, lead to life for all who are willing to follow his lead. So it may well be true that we know not what we do these days. But we thank God that the one we follow, even to the cross, Jesus Christ, does. Amen.